Let's take the Word of God, please, this evening and turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. And over the next few months, we're going to be teaching and preaching through this book, and it's a wonderful book, a wonderful gospel. Um, it's unlike the other three, uh, because John, of course, as the other ones, wrote it with a specific purpose. You see, John is getting older, and um, Peter, Paul, the other apostles, they've died. Uh, he's the only one left. And Christianity has spread into all the world. It's going everywhere. And so now there's more Greeks being in the church than there are Jewish people. And we know that over time, um, things begin to drift. And when different cultures get into the church, nothing wrong with those cultures necessarily, but they bring the ideas of that culture into the church. And John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, being nudged by the Holy Spirit, sat down and penned this book uh, with the other three Gospels having been written. He knew well the content of those, and he will write his Gospel, uh, and primarily he's dealing with the Judean ministry in Judah of uh, Christ, while the other ones were in the Galilee ministry. And John would write... Um, some people have called this gospel the spiritual gospel uh, because he takes the miracles and gives the teaching right after it of Christ and which would give deeper meaning to the things that were going on in John's day. And so John, uh, living in Ephesus, would pen this book somewhere around between 85 and 90 AD. And he wrote it and we don't have to look far to find his purpose. In, in John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, here it is, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. John's purpose for writing this was to let people know who Jesus was. And I'm going to talk, and I'm, I'm named the whole study of the book of John, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And even in our culture today, we deal with that issue. Some people don't believe that he was a perfect, sinless son of God. Some people don't even, just think he's a good man, um, but not God in the flesh, not God among us and lived among us and died on a cross to save us from our sins. We can never get away from this. John's writing so that people would know who Jesus was so that people could be saved. A lot of times people, cultures drift and even churches drift and they get off of the main thing which is to preach the true Christ, the true and only God and salvation through Christ and not of works, not of anything else. And we wouldn't, many churches would not say that we preach, they preach a, a works religion, but that's mostly what they talk about all the time is how to live, not uh, the life of Christ living through us, not we must be born again, and we do it off somewhere in a little room, and then we come in, and we don't learn the deeper truths about Christ, and so John is writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to give his readers and us a wake-up call to say, hey, let's not get off of the main thing. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And every person that is going to be saved, that is going to be born again, is going to have to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. We can't add philosophy, psychology, I'll get saved and do this. Absolutely not. It is totally by grace, through faith, that we're saved. And there's no other way around that. And John wanted to write a book. And, through the, and God, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the, the real author of this book, uh, wanted to keep us in tune. And let's be careful today if we don't get sidetracked. Um, 
and our heads get messed up and the things that's going on around us is talked about more than Christ is talked about and the issues of the day become more important than uh, Jesus Christ and the church and we need to keep in mind we are the saved we are children of a different kingdom and the world is the children of a different kingdom they have another God the God of this world who is the devil and we have a, our God is Christ and God the Father and so we need to keep these things in mind and get our head back in the game and start focusing on these things. These are the issues we are dealing with. This is what the attack is against, is to distract us from these important truths in Scripture. And so we're going to go through John, and it's going to be an exciting study. I'm, I'm so excited to go through this. And uh, being a pastor for over 30 years, I've, I've, obviously I probably you know I've preached through this a couple times. But every time I do, and I study it afresh, it's not like I just pull out notes. No, I study it again. And I get fired up, and I get excited um, about who Jesus Christ is. And so that's the question that, that we're going to look at as we go through this book. And John's going to reveal him through sign miracles, he calls it, through seven I am statements by Christ, which I believe if we could get the depth of those and apply them to our life, those are the seven pillars of a Christian's life is the I am sayings in John and we'll talk about that when we get to those sayings but this evening we want to get into the verse uh, first five verses of John and I'm going to do just like John did I'm just going to jump right in John really I mean his just jumps right in he he doesn't have the the birth of Christ he passes over that he passes past the Old Testament prophecies and goes right back to the beginning. He goes right back to the beginning. In verse 1 he says, In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. I mean, he goes all the way back. He skips all, over all this stuff and says, Hey, let's, let's just go back to where it all started. Jesus was in the beginning. And this is a very important statement. Because just like in the beginning of Genesis 1-1, In the beginning God. So here we have, In the beginning was the Word. Jesus, this word, this, this word was in this, means that Jesus already was. And the tense of the verb means that he was previous before the beginning. And he continues on, which means that Christ is eternal. He's the eternal God. And he's at the beginning. In the beginning, that word could be source uh, or, or just at the beginning. Jesus was in the beginning. He was before the beginning. He's after beginning. He's eternal God. He existed before the beginning. And so this is a, a great statement because the term here for word logos in the Greek is the Greek philosophers, they would sit around and gaze at the stars and, and they were smart men. And smart men will think this way, even though they might not find their way to God necessarily this way. But these Greek philosophers looked and go, they watched the stars, they watched the sun rise in the morning, set in the evening, they watched the seasons of the year, and they go, there has to be something behind that. There has to be reason behind that. There has to be wisdom behind that. And they called it the Logos. When you would ask a Greek philosopher, where did all this come from? And they would go, the Logos. And John, referring to Jesus as the word is he's dealing right with the Greek philosophy of their day he says okay guys here's the word this is the logos this is the reality of it this is the one who's behind all this stuff this is the one who's behind the rising of the Sun when it does and the setting of the Sun and the tides in the ocean he's the one behind this this is the logos this is the real thing this is not a shadow this is this is him Jesus Christ and of course, the Jews, they knew the word Logos, and they applied it to God. They knew that God spoke the world, and they knew the six, uh, the, the six days of creation, the day of rest. They knew he spoke in the Abrahamic covenant. They knew he spoke his word would not return void. They knew about the Logos of God. And so when John presented this to the Greeks, they, they would be stepped back and go, 
That's the logos. That's the reason. That's the wisdom behind all this stuff. And the Jews, they would go, this is the incarnation. This is the revelation of God. Because that's what the word was, was a revelation of God's heart and God's mind. And so when Jesus appears and John says, hey, let me tell you who this is. It's the Logos. I mean, he captured both, both cultures right there. He used a word that brought everybody attention and raised everybody's eyebrows when they go, what? Jesus is the revelation of God? He's an incarnation? He's the fleshing of God, Emmanuel, with us that we read about in the Old Testament? To the philosopher, the Greek philosopher, he's the reason, he's the wisdom He's the, the, the purpose, he's the, the reason all this stuff happens. He is. He's the eternal one. He's the one that's, that did it all. So my first point is, John says here in this first phrase, Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. But not only is he eternal, look at the next phrase. And the word was with God. The word was with God. Now, literally, this means... Face to face. Jesus and God the Father, God the Son, were face to face from all eternity. All eternity. As far back as you can think, before anything was. The Father and the Son were face to face. When he says, the Word was with God. That, that's great. Now, Jesus is not an attribute of God. Jesus is a person. Jesus is a person. Not only is he eternal but he is an eternal person. He, has, he was pre-existent. And from all, t- all before time, Jesus and the Father, the word, that's, the, that's the word picture, they would see it, it was face to face, meaning an intimate fellowship. And we believe the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Distinct in personality. Same in essence. And in this essence... The Father and the Son were, in, were close. But Jesus was a person. Not some emanation, not some principle, not some uh, ideal, not just a, a good thought. Jesus was a person. This person was pre existent. So he's co eternal coexistent with the Father. To the Jews, I mean, this is for them. And we know as we read the other Gospels that the clashes he had with the Pharisees and, and how they would say, you claim to be God. Here, John, in the first verse, <laughs> he says, this is who Jesus was. He's eternal, and he's co-eternal with the Father because they were. he was with God in his pre-existence. He was with God now. And so Jesus is a person, face to face. And I think as we look at this and we go to the third thing, it says, and the Word was God. The Word was God. I think what John wants to, what's he intending to do here is as we look at the, and read the, the, the works and the deeds of Christ through this book. In reality, we're reading the words and the works of God. I mean, John set it up, and I think everything he wants this one verse to be the back, backdrop to everything we study in this book. That this is not just a man doing miracles. This is not just a man saying these things. This is God. This is God's words and God's deeds and Jesus is here and revealing the mind and heart of God to us. What a beginning. I mean, John pulls no punches from the first verse. I love it. He might not pass a preaching course in college, but boy, he can lay her out there beginning on the first verse of who Jesus is. And so we got so far. In the beginning was the Word. He's eternal, preexisting. The Word was with God. He was a person in fellowship, face to face with God. And the Word was God. 
I mean, this is one of the most, if not the most, definitive statements in Scripture about the deity of Christ. The Word was God. He was deity. He was God. He, John wanted to bring this generation that had come on the scene and the church had been spreading it's the gospel, of course, and churches have been springing up everywhere. And John remembered that, hey, he was a charter member in the upper room. 120 met in the upper room and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and went out and preached. And John was a part of that 120 that went out and saw the church grow by 3,000 in one day. John knew the doctrines that they were preaching. Read the book of Acts. And now as he's getting older, he's saying, let's get back to that. Let's get back to Jesus. Let's get back to who Jesus really is. Let's think about his preexistence, his eternalness. Let's think about his oneness with the Father. Let's think about him as God. Let's think about Jesus as God. Then that takes our singing in church, takes on a different light. Our preaching, our reading of the Bible now, when we read the Gospels and we read about Jesus, it's not that we just we become so familiar with Christ that, hey, this is deity we're talking about. This is God. This is the, look at what he says in verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. But verse 3 All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. He's the creator. He's God. He's deity. He was, he, 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 he's, he, he's eternal. And he came and became flesh. We read in verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When we see that idea of truth, it's like the real thing. It's real. That's the real thing. That's the reality. Jesus is the reality of all this stuff. He's the creator. He's, he's created things. Everything from a molecule to the galaxies that you can read about. And I've heard some people talk about how, the, how, the, how space is and they give all these numbers. I'm not going to do that and waste, waste my time with it. But I like to hear somebody talk about it. But I'm not really into that. I can just look up at the stars at night and go, wow. Anybody that can create just what I see, that's pretty good. And not understanding everything that goes on and on galaxies beyond ours. That's who he is. That's who he is. And when we think about that, passages like Philippians chapter 2, in Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, um, we know the passage, you maybe know the one I'm going to read, but in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, there he is, he's God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. There's something we can bow over. There's when we'll bow. Not bowing to an antichrist. But every, it says every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and, and, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This creator, this God, this Jesus that we talk about today, and sometimes we're so familiar with it, that one day in the future, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even the ones today who say that he's not perfect, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He's the creator God. 
He created all these things. He's equal with God. He's coexistent with God. He's God. And every knee will bow one day and acknowledge that. Let's not get caught up with all these things that's going on in the world. Our allegiance is to the kingdom of God. And if there's any bowing going on, it's to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we might think it's just people bowing. And you say, don't be patriotic and talk about it. I'm not talking about the flag. That kneeling has a lot more to do with what I'm talking about than the flag. Jesus is Lord. Will not bow. He's creator. Let's look at some verses about that in, in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul writing. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Let's begin in verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1. Jesus as, is creator. Verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. Listen to this. All things. You see that? All things. That are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. That means things we see, physical and the spiritual. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. By him and for him. Now we think, okay, preacher, <coughs> since things are created for him and I mean, by him and for him, it's really not going that way right now. You're right. You remember Genesis 3. Adam and Eve fell into sin. When, he, when, 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 when sin entered this world, this creation was marred, just like human beings are. We, we're born with a sin nature. We're sinners when we're born. There's no doubt about it. So is our creation a little, little off. Our society's off. It's not the way it was created initially. Adam and Eve in a perfect environment in the garden, and they fell into sin, and so sin entered in and messed up the creation. Messed it up. Sin, now men would work and and eat by the sweat of their brow. They would deal with thorns and different things in the earth that would <coughs> always cause an obstacle. They'd have to overcome to, to do the things they needed to do. <coughs> it's because of sin. Sin messed this thing up. But Jesus created it for him and by him. I mean, by him and for him. In Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, Excuse me, chapter 1, verse 1. Verse 1, verse 2, he says, And God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the Father by the prophets, hath now in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. He made the worlds. And if Jesus is God, we can read in Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Romans chapter 1, verse 25, it says, Who changed the truth into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. If Jesus is God, then they, people have started worshiping the creature more than the Creator. They started going down. Spend some time in Romans chapter 1. It'll explain what's going on in our society. In Romans chapter 1, John 8, 44, there's all kinds of things. Other verses in the Bible, kingdom of darkness and kingdom of light, kingdom of Satan, kingdom of God. They turn against the Creator. They don't want anybody to judge. People don't want, the lost people do, want, do not want to judge. They don't want to be accountable. They want justice, but they go out and break the law. What is that? How's that work? I mean, you know? But it's all against the Creator. And the Creator brings perfect justice. Perfect justice. So Jesus is Creator. 
Let's go back to John chapter 1. In verse 4. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus is the source of life and light. Now just like when it said Jesus, when it just like when it said that in the beginning was the word, the was the word was God. This is just like that's what it means in light and life. In him was life. That means in him was life. Self existent. <laughs> it didn't depend on anybody for life. Doesn't get his life from anybody. He is life. The life of God. That's the reason we read in 1 John chapter 5, if any man hath the Son, hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Why? Because if you have Jesus Christ living in us, we have life. The life of God in us. Here, life and light. So, and, and, this, and, this, and, this, and the life was the light of men. When Jesus came, <coughs> he was life. He was the reality. He, he would come and take on demons and cast demons out. When it came to sicknesses, he could heal sicknesses. He could walk on water. He controlled nature. He controlled storms. Jesus was life. And he tell, he'd tell us later in John that he came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. Now, when you see when he's referring to here, this life, when Jesus is, when he's talking about this, he's referring to spiritual life. Or eternal life. Either one. In spiritual life, we have eternal life. Quality life. And so when Jesus came, his life was light. The life of God was light to men. It's just like in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, um, Paul, no, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 of chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He's the one that makes us alive spiritually. He's the one that gives us eternal life. And when we see the life of Christ, it's a lot to us. If we read on, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the hour, <coughs> the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the spirit of disobedience working in our world today. And when you, when you throw the life of Christ on that, they don't like it. The world doesn't like that. Christ came and then when his light came, he came to a dark world. Verse 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That means the darkness didn't overcome it. The darkness couldn't overcome it. Let me tell you, I tell you what, the darkness is doing everything it can to overcome the life of Christ. The more our society drifts farther and farther away and getting ready for the Antichrist system to appear, the more we should present Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the eternal God, as the Creator God, as the only one that has life and light. And when we back off of that and want to give speeches on something else, we've missed our calling. We're walking away from our calling as the New Testament Christian church and as preachers. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Don't you think, you think they, they say, well, they don't know the truth. What did James say? James says that the devils believe and tremble. Devils. Jesus would cast out demons in the other gospels, the other accounts, and they would say, we know who you are. Go to Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. This is God's word on the situation, not my word. You can discount my word on this, but not God's word. Listen to this. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And we're working from, The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. 
they did not over could not overcome it they could not they will not it might look dark but it looked dark when Jesus was on the cross and his disciples were fleeting what happened to this god man but boy 3 days later when Jesus rose from the dead the darkness could not keep him the darkness cannot stop him. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. And let's not act like he is going to. It might get dark. But as long as we're holding up Jesus Christ, that's the light. That's the light. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. They know. They know. I'm telling you, if they're in my lifetime, and there might have been other times, I'm sure in the day of Jesus, it was there were some lines drawn. But not, in, in my lifetime, I've not seen a clearer line between light and darkness in our country. To where you just scratch your head and go, why would anybody think that way until you go to the Bible? And you know that they're, they're children of the devil. Let's call it, let's say it what it is. And they know the truth. God has showed it unto them. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him, the creation of the world, are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. When the light shined in darkness, the darkness tried to overcome that light. But they couldn't do it. They couldn't comprehend. They couldn't bring it in. They couldn't hold it. They couldn't control God because God's in control. They couldn't dictate to God because God is the one who dictates to us. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. And their foolish heart darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And any time we go against the light of Jesus Christ, I didn't say it. The Bible says it. You become fools. If we know where we stand and we know we're dealing with fools and know where they're coming, know that where they're coming from, it's a little bit easier. It's not easy, but at least we go, okay, I know now this is a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle. I, there's more to this than just meets the eye. There's a line that's being drawn that is so crisp, so crisp. It's almost like Jesus came and shined his, shined his life on, the, on, on, on America, on the world. And all of a sudden, boy, the lines are drawn. The battleground is laid out. But for the church, for the church, our message is Jesus is eternal. He's preexistent. Jesus is a person. He's real. Jesus is God. Jesus is creator. Jesus is the only source of life and light. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. When we see people that are in office stand up and pray and then lead against everything right, push abortions, which is murder. This verse, these verse describes this. John chapter 1 verse 5 describes this. 
darkness will always try to overcome. There will always be the big mouse. Always will be the scoffers. Always be the scorners. Peter tells us that in the last days, scoffers shall come and say, where is the promise that he promised he would come? Where is he? Friend, he's coming. He's coming. And when he comes, every knee will bow. Not to the God of this world. Not to the bales of this world. But they will bow and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And friend, let me tell you, this is our Savior. He came to save. If we don't put our trust in this Christ, which is the only one, but there's a lot of fake ones out there, made up ones. We want the one of the Bible. If we don't put our trust in Him, there is nothing but wrath for us. There is a hell. I don't care if we're in the 21st century or not. Hell is still in the Bible. It's okay to preach about hell. It's okay. It's, Jesus did. But we're scared of it. We want to be real nice now. We want, we, want to, we want to make anybody mad. I don't want to make anybody mad either. But there's a hell. And if you don't know this Jesus, if you don't know the Jesus that's creator, that's co-eternal, co coexistent with the Father, second person of the Trinity, if you don't know him as your Savior, and you're trying to work your way, and you're trying to get to heaven because you got baptized, or you went to church, or, you, or you've been in church all your life, friend, that doesn't cut it. It's when I look at him and go, there is nothing I can do. I am such a sinner on the inside. That there is nothing I can do to save myself. If I try, I'll end up praying and, act, and then turning around in my life like I don't even know God. It's time for us to examine ourselves. Because the wrath of God has been revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. There would be wrath. And I don't wish it on anybody. And so I want to ask you this evening there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior, if you were to die today, what would your confidence be in? Would it be in this? Or would you stand before God and give some feeble excuses, but I did this and I did that, and you're going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Into outer darkness. Tonight's the night. Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for Jesus, Father. Lord, thank you. Lord, I'm so happy, God, to get into these verses and how it thrills my soul. With all the bad news going on around the world, God, to get into this and to see the wonderful Savior, God, that we have. And Lord, I pray that people will be saved from this message that the Holy Spirit of God would be so powerful in people's hearts to convict them that they need a Savior, that they're in darkness, but the life of Christ is light to them. This is the God. Save souls, Father. Encourage Christians. Restore the fallen. And we'll praise you for everything you do in Jesus' name. Amen.